So today I'm going to be talking about the PAPRA, uh, which is an open sourced uh, powered respirator um, that in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'll give you a little bit of history. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Daryl Huang. Uh, I'm a assistant professor of research at the University of Southern California's uh, Keck School of Medicine, uh, working in the Department of Radiology. And I'm here with um, Tetra Bio Distributed. Uh, we're a nonprofit set up uh, for open um, source hardware design for medical applications. So just in case anybody um, hasn't heard about this thing called COVID-19, just, uh, just to give you a little bit, uh, it, it is short for coronavirus disease 2019, not the iteration, like a scale of the 19th version. It, it was not the 19th version of the coronavirus disease. Uh, it is caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, you might have heard of the SARS-CoV-1 virus, which was actually SARS. Um, and we can talk about, and why did it spread so so far and so quickly? Uh, number one, infectious people uh, were infectious days before they presented symptoms. And so people were unwillingly uh, or unwittingly uh, infecting other people because they didn't know they were sick. Uh, also, um, this was a novel virus, meaning that we didn't really have treatment or understanding. And uh, finally, we um, know the exact spread mechanism. Was this you know, primary surface contact? Was this airborne? Turns out it's a combination of all the above. Um, it's actually a little bit more difficult to spread than we uh, a worst case scenario, but uh, some of the newest ver uh, variants that have come out have been shown to be uh, even more infectious, so that might not even be holding true these days. Uh, BA5 apparently is as infectious as measles, so uh, joy. Yeah, it's not over yet. Okay. So just to give an idea how this has affected uh, us here just in the United States, uh, this is a month-by-month -month chart put out this by the CDC of COVID deaths, just, just deaths. We're not even talking about the hospitalizations and the people that are suffering from long COVID or recovered. This is just deaths. And to summarize this, this is approximately that many people in the United States only that have passed away from COVID um, uh, or at least being COVID positive. Even if you're at the most uh, conservative estimates, this many people dying is not normal, okay? So you might have heard some statistics out there. It's like, oh, this isn't as, this is just like any other cold. Nah, it isn't, you know? It just, it, it isn't, it's not even close. So why do we get onto this entire uh, path of looking at a PAPR? And that's because in March of 2020, this was the actual guideline that came out of the CDC. They told us uh, in healthcare that if we ran out of masks to wear a bandana. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, we, we were in that situation. New York, uh, uh, LA actually was fairly insulated from that. We were, were, we were lagging behind New York in terms of cases. New York definitely hit this where there were uh, healthcare providers, frontline healthcare providers that had no PPE and were making do with, you know, bandanas and scarves around their faces while treating active COVID patients. And so uh, just to give you a little timeline of how this project started, we started out uh, at uh, Keck um, with a appeal from my a uh, clinical um, uh, director from the radiology said, hey, we have this 3D, I saw this 3D printing thing over on the East Coast, can we do it? And in the course of a couple of days, we basically ramped up, talked to a whole bunch of people, and by the end of the pandemic, started doing things and started making things like 3D printed uh, respirators and face shields. In fact, our face shields were actually clinically deployed, and we gave out I think close to 6,000 of them uh, just within our organization. And mainly because the, the reason we didn't give out more is because we didn't need to. We actually gave one to every person that needed it and they were cleaning it and reusing it. Uh, we printed about 9,000 uh, of the uh, 3D printed masks uh, that were never deployed because we actually in LA had enough PPE uh, through beg, borrowing and stealing all across everywhere. We were able to keep enough 
uh, supply of good um, uh, N95 masks for the people that needed it. And actually, uh, our next talk is going to be talking a little bit about that, the entire shortage of N95s and the, the, the issues around that. Uh, but that's what it looks like. Um, the, huh? No, 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 always a preview. Always a preview. Uh, yeah. Sorry, a, spo a spoiler alert. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so going on from there, this is the picture actually that I was telling you earlier that my high school friend recognized me off of that I hadn't seen in 15 years because I was wearing this mask while shopping in Total Wine and he just stopped me. Anyways, uh, we basically ran a commu uh, community printing effort. And this is actually a part of the genesis of the ideas that we had for open hardware design. We actually reached out to the community and it, um, went to maker spaces, uh, talked to people in the community that uh, just happened to have 3D printers. And then we tapped a large untapped resource, which was our uh, School of Architecture had like a roster of uh, over 200 students that actually just had 3D printers at home as part of their normal usage. And we started uh, ramping up and doing 3D printing in a community sense. Uh, this is just some pictures of the stuff that we were making at the time. And then uh, simultaneous to that, we were talking about what else can we do? And we started working on uh, the PAPR. We started off with this uh, organization that uh, was known as PAPR Life Force. And uh, like many things that started in the, um, the, during the pandemic, uh, it was well-intentioned, it, it, it grew very quickly and then um, it, it, it flamed out. Uh, <laughs> it dissolved uh, in September. And that's actually when I took the PAPR and brought it to uh, Tetra Bio Distributed, which was another organization I was working with on a different project, which was a vent splitter project. Um, so uh, Tetra started off its life uh, as a vent splitter uh, um, uh, company or project working uh, in March 2020. Uh, it basically consists of a very diverse group of engineers and scientists all around the globe. Uh, we had people in Colorado, we had people in uh, England, um, and uh, Great Britain in general. Not you mean America? At one point we had a member of North Africa. Yeah. Was yeah, so it, it was a very widespread and uh, through the, the magic of the internet and the fact that none of us were going anywhere outside of our uh, uh, immediate dwellings. Uh, we had a very intense group uh, working on um, um, projects uh, during uh, the beginning and middle of COVID uh, pandemic, well, beginning and middle of the COVID pandemic as it was progressing. And um, yeah, uh, vent splitters are hard. Well, we can talk about that on the side, uh, uh, even if it wasn't a pandemic. Yeah, because frankly, they're kind of a weird middle device that very difficult to get right. Um, but uh, Tetra Bio, we kind of pivoted uh, towards um, uh, the Citra, which is actually something preview, spoiler alert, uh, Daniel's going to be uh, talking about, and the PAPR, uh, which are more achievable goals. And why do we say that? It's because these are two devices that are used as uh, PPE as opposed to uh, devices geared uh, towards direct uh, medical intervention. So a splitter would be, you know, you're ventilating multiple people with one ventilator. That has an entire set of regulatory issues uh, uh, associated with this. PPE has a, uh, has a no less complicated uh, set of regulatory issues, but a different regulatory uh, issue pathways. And then, uh, so at our peak, we had about 30 uh, volunteers, and now we have about 10 that work um, um, in the course of this. And again, it's like many of the pandemic uh, groups, you know, people find jobs, uh, people start working on other projects. Uh, and, uh, you know, to find more about this, uh, please check out these two websites. One's our, uh, uh, the first one is our, uh, our standard website and the other one is our GitHub, which actually you can find this entire project there. So let's talk a little bit about our design goals. So these are some of the design goals that we came up with right in the beginning. And we wanted something that provided at least N95 levels of protection because anything less than N95, you're, it wouldn't be useful for us. Uh, we're, we initially, we're thinking about this in the context of hospital care or frontline workers interacting um, with other people and with possibly um, um, COVID patients, right? And so N95 is, 
the bare minimum level that we wanted to reach. Uh, also, we wanted something that could be worn for a long period of time. Um, these disposable N95 masks are only rated for four hours at a time. Uh, so a well-fitted N95 mask, you're only supposed to wear it four hours at a time. That doesn't mean we don't wear it for longer, but it is only supposed to be worn because after that amount of time, uh, there is an increased resistance that you have to breathe through. So you might actually have a little bit of effects, headaches and stuff like that, if you wear them too long. And uh, that might be inconvenient for somebody, but if you're in a healthcare situation and you're making life or death decisions, that might actually become uh, you know, an issue later on. Uh, also, the the entire comfort aspect is y y you you might think oh well if it's just annoying on the face that's not that bad. Well, when you do an eight hour shift and you're getting pressure sores on your face because these masks are biting into you, that that becomes an issue after a while. Um, one of the other uh, the caveats is we needed to be able to change the battery very quickly because you don't really want to stop breathing in the middle of a shift. Uh, it need to be lightweight. This wouldn't be useful if we're carrying around a cart with it. Uh, and in uh, 2020, we wanted to use non-COVID rationed uh, components. That means something that wasn't already being provided to the hospital. So for example, if we could create a PAPR that used PAPR filters and we couldn't get PAPR filters, that was a pointless device. Uh, attachable to a belt backpack carrying system. Most PAPR devices are actually a belt system already. And we wanted to um, you know, mimic that and be able to modify off of that. Uh, easy donning and doffing. Um, donning is putting something on. Doffing is taking it off, for those of you that have never heard of those terms. Uh, the reason why that's important is uh, cross-contamination is one of the biggest ways that you can actually spread um, you know, any kind of uh, pathogen. It's you contaminate your hands, and then you rub your eyes. That's actually why we tell you to you know, wash your hands so often during this pandemic. And then finally, 100% uh, open source where, where possible. Because where we see is that uh, places, uh, let's be honest, uh, during COVID, right, one of the issues that we found is that supply chain, when it breaks, uh, you can't get anything. And if you can't get it, no matter how much money you have, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter because you can't get it. It just doesn't exist. But beyond that, one of the problems is, is that we live in um, a a world where healthcare inequities exist. And a PAPR unit generally costs around $1,600 um, on the low end. And there are plenty of places around the world, even within our communities, that don't have the resources to outfit everybody that needs a PAPR because of sheer cost. And so we wanted to keep the open source aspect so that people could uh, continue developing and also using this without uh, you know, paying exorbitant amounts. And we wanted to design this for distributed manufacturing. Again, going back to uh, the shortages, one of the problems that we uh, had was the fact that our supply chains were cut. So traditional manufacturing, which most of it is done overseas for these de devices, were not available to us. And looking forward, we would, we would like to have something that is able to be essentially produced locally on site uh, where things are needed, as opposed to far, far away and then shipped um, uh, uh, to a place. Because you never know what the next pandemic is going to be. You don't know what the next outbreak is going to be and where a, a lot of these devices will be needed. And finally, the last design goal that we came up with, because we talked to our UK and people that live in areas that apparently have this thing that comes in the sky in terms of water, I think they call it rain, um, is splash resistance. Uh, because a wet filter is a non-working filter. Oh, and since then, uh, one of our, uh, the, the entire rationed uh, components we've uh, kind of uh, abandoned because we don't need to live up to that anymore right now. Uh, here's an example of an early prototype. Uh, number one, it never worked. You probably can see the errors in this right now. The fan was outside of the sealed box, so it was sucking in slight amounts of uh, air, which is just enough that it would fail the uh, the tests that were useful for it, but it was useful in uh, looking at our uh, uh, you know if 3D printing would work as a technology to create components, and it was sort of the genesis of the design aspects of this. Um, here's uh, our October 2020 um, iteration. Uh, 
going forward, all these iterations from now on actually work. They actually pass the N95 rating uh, on the test. Uh, what we've been doing is creating basically a more robust um, uh, PAPR unit because a lot of times these were very finicky to get to pass. You might have to um, um, uh, tinker around with it. And um, you know, sometimes it didn't work for other reasons. For example, this one, uh, we decided to try a, um, a dual hose method, as you see uh, Mark there wearing the dual ho hose mask, uh, where the, in, uh, the inspiration and the expiration goes out the same filter. And uh, it, that turned out to be a bad idea because we did a CO2, entitled CO2 check and found out that, uh, it, yeah, it was a great way to, to, to rebreathe air. Um, wasn't deadly unless you kept on going for hours. Um, but uh, all the, in this case, all the uh, components were uh, sourced uh, from Amazon. Um, the next level, so starting in uh, 2021, uh, January, uh, we, we tested out some new uh, masks. So the other aspect of this, we're trying to make 3D printed masks that would fit on the face that you could actually make yourself. So we actually looked into um, uh, printing in flexible materials like Ninja Flex. Um, it's an incredibly challenging uh, field of printing flexibles, which we did not fully uh, <laughs> we did not fully um, uh, comprehend in the beginning. But we quickly realized that it is not uh, simple. Even 3D printing isn't really simple to begin with, but so that was even worse. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So eventually, we uh, uh, ended up uh, with uh, that type of design. The inhale and exhale valve would have been fine, except for the fact that what was what was happening was uh, the the exhaled air was just getting sucked right back into the filter. So that was a problem with using one filter. Yeah. So that's why we got rid of that particular. Um, uh, version. But as you can see, like, you know, we're trying to iterate on this and we're learning a lot of uh, things and uh, finding out where the issues were and, um, you know, learning process. Uh, this is actually the first model that we uh, created a board uh, for the power and we'll talk about that as we get into the design. Um, next iteration, as you can see, it's about every month or so that we're, we're doing these uh, uh, build parties. Uh, we made some board changes um, and then um, uh, we made a bunch of masks that felt okay, but we're still iterating on design. Um, and then we got into quantitative testing. So uh, just very briefly, how do we test these things? Uh, that's actually a very good question because at the beginning of the pandemic, the standard way to test an N95 mask was a qualitative test. You put one on, you throw a hood over somebody, you spray chemicals in there, either Vitrix or saccharin, and then you say, hey, do you taste anything? Right? Big problem. What's one of the symptoms of COVID-19? <laughs> yeah, that, that, <laughs> yeah, that's one of the problems, right? Well, it, it, going along that, w uh, we decided that we needed a more quantitative test. So we actually gone to uh, actual particle uh, filtration testing, which is the qu uh, quantitative way that you would do this type of testing. But we've adapted the rig so that we can test our devices also. So this device that you see here is actually a port account. It's normally used to test these disposable masks for fit. But we've uh, uh, basically made it so that we can uh, test our devices to see if it's filtering at least at the, uh, the rate that we're talking about. And it's important that we were doing this because the filters that we were using at the time were just standard HEPA filters used for air purifiers. And we also learned some things uh, along the way, among which is if it says HEPA, true HEPA, or any of those variants of true HEPA, those actually filter um, at, at the N95 level. If it says HEPA type or HEPA like or any of those other variants that are not true HEPA, those filter at 10 times worse than um, uh, the, the HEPA filters. And that was actually a very big revelation because none of this is really documented quite clearly um, uh, anywhere. So, uh, you know, when you go home and check your air filters now, you might be like, hey, wait a second, this thing is doing nothing. Okay, uh, so yes, I, as I said, the TSI port account, and then uh, we, uh, this one we experimented with a proprietary connector because we're looking for a locking connector for power. Uh, anybody here do hardware? Uh, yeah? 
uh, do you know of a good connector for power that locks and is watertight? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a that's that that's one of the or at least you know water resist splash resistant. That's that's the problem we came up with is that look these these connectors would cost as much as the box. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, so this is the April iteration. We started, um, uh, we changed it up. We moved all the inputs onto one side of the fan box. Uh, therefore, the entire fan and uh, filter or, uh, funnel unit that you see there uh, with the output, that was actually one complete unit when we completed it. And then you just slotted it in. We also started working with uh, some more, mo more moisture protection. Uh, we just made louvers so that the water would slough off a little bit. And then uh, we added BNC connectors. We're actually using BNC connectors as our connectors so that they don't disconnect. The, the important thing here is that we have a power supply that is not firmly attached to our uh, power unit. And what happens when you use just a regular, you know, 5.5 millimeter jack, um, jack, well, you move a little bit and it pops off and suddenly you don't have air being pumped to you, which is something that most people don't like is suddenly having their airflow stopped. So we, we had to redesign a little bit. Um, so the May 2021 iteration now with the actual physical weather guard on top, uh, this again was to help out our people that are living in um, rainier uh, climes, uh, mainly just to prevent water from getting directly onto the filter. Because if you saturate a filter, that becomes essentially a wet cloth, and a wet cloth over your face is called waterboarding. And you don't want that, you don't want to do that to yourself, and uh, this is one of the reasons uh, why we were looking at this. Um, now we tried an iteration where we 3, 3D printed all the, um, uh, the the 3D printed clips to hold everything together because we're trying to get uh, lessen the number of parts. That didn't work very well, so we went back to our tried and true screws, um, and then we started testing uh, flow testing and battery. So one of the things is is that it and it's kind of hard to do is correct testing, like um, uh, trying to figure out exact flow um, uh, of air uh, through a circuit is not the, the simplest of um, uh, tasks. And there's also a lot of conflict, conflicting guidelines on how much air uh, that you need flowing. Um, the standards are actually very vague because some of them aren't true standards. They're actually just guidelines that are posted. So we've been working our way through that, trying to balance the power consumption with the uh, type of fan that we have and different grades of fan. Uh, one of the things that we've been trying to do is use fans that are made of uh, uh, traditional blower fans or 12 volt blower fans because you can actually access those. Um, you know, there are specialty fans made for uh, CPAP companies, and those can range uh, over $200 a fan. Uh, and we're not looking into those because the average person is not going to be able to get that. So we're looking at um, devices that you can order off a of DigiKey or Mauser or Amazon. So that's one of the um, uh, design constraints that we have. Yeah. Was it 150 LPM? No. Well, so, so there's actually a couple of reasons. Uh, traditional pappers are actually vented into the open space. And so you need enough air flowing so that there is no chance of um, uh, taking a deep breath and back breathing in. Plus you have to fill that entire space uh, of the hood. So, uh, so like that's generally the six CFM um, uh, minimum that you have set. In fact, that actually goes higher than that. Uh, most pappers, I think, get up to 12. I think they can push 12. But those are all hooded uh, pappers. Half-face respirator pappers are a little bit more uncommon, and they're kind of a, um, a, a, a sub-variant of that. And that's why I think uh, uh, it was four, two to four, right? Is the, uh, no, that's four, four to six, yeah. Um, the, the question is, is whether or not you'll actually ever use that. Um, but um, 
let's let's wait until the uh, question and answer because no no I I, I because uh, our uh, uh, I have more of a resident expert uh, in that side that can uh, uh, talk to, talk about that. Yeah yeah, it works both ways. <laughs> Okay, and now in February uh, 2022, yeah, well, we started live streaming uh, because we were, uh, we're actually showing people how we build these units. So in, in addition to having all our files online um, uh, in GitHub that you can download, print it, uh, and uh, the circuit board and the circuit diagrams online and being able to, you know, fab a board if you want, we also went the extra step of showing people how to assemble from scratch all, um, um, uh, one of our units. And we've been doing that. So uh, in June uh, 2022, we did uh, we did another one, and it's now on YouTube and it's also on Twitch. So if you're interested in checking that out, um, uh, these these slides will all be made available on the website, right? So that they'll you can you can get that, or if you want to take a picture. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, hopefully you can download the the slide, and it'll be a lot easier. So uh, give you an idea, the, our current generation, this is the, the latest one that uh, we've de developed, is much smaller. I actually have some here so we can talk about it afterwards, but if you take a look at it, it's basically a fan unit. We're actually using two uh, P100 filters. These are the Klein tools or uh, GSV, um, uh, uh, half-face respirator filters, and we're using those as the, um, as the filtering material for this. Uh, some of you have probably seen uh, the um, the 3M filters, right? Like, uh, yeah, the 3M filters. Uh, uh, one of the problems actually with 3M filters is they have a proprietary bayonet connector that's really annoying to actually 3D print something that attaches cleanly to that. And it's a very small opening. So we wanted something a little bit more. So we've been experimenting with other filters. The original filter that we uh, started with actually was a Germ Guardian uh, uh, air purifying filter. Um, yeah. Yeah, a Germ Guardian uh, filter, which is a, a larger format, and this is one of the reasons why the format the the it appears bigger. The other boxes is that we just change filters. Um, so just to break it down, so this is actually all the components of a um, uh, uh, of a fan box. Uh, everything uh, everything here is uh, essentially you can make it except for uh, these two pieces. Uh, and the screws. Well, I guess you can make screws if you're really good, but um, uh, we normally order the screws from McMaster right now, and then the fan and the BNC connector are the only two components that are not uh, custom uh, uh, built. Uh, everything else, including, for example, um, uh, right here, this is the, 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 the weather guard, and all the plastic pieces are all made for 3D printing. We've been printing this on a Prusa, and I've actually printed it uh, previously on an Ender 3, um, we printed out of PETG, uh, which is a little bit more uh, uh, resilient than uh, PLA. But in general, one thing to remember, and uh, it, it's been brought up a lot, which is, uh, oh, 3D printing, it's permeable, it, you know, it has, it, you might have issues with it. In essence, all you have to do is prevent air from passing, right? Uh, you're not going to submerge this for hours on end. You're not going to try to hold liquid in it. You're just trying to prevent air. You're trying to channel air through a filtration device. And if your filtration device or filtration uh, m medium, like uh, the filters, is more resistive than the plastic, then you probably have other issues that you're working with. But in this case, what we have is the um, um, everything is 3D printable, and we've optimized it to print on FDM printers. So uh, everything that we do here is on FDM printers because most people, A, don't have resin, uh, or um, uh, uh, you know, any other you know, powder technology at home. The other thing is that all our seals are actually made out of craft foam cut on a cricket. So we have cricket files, you cut it on craft foam. It's actually really, really useful uh, for those of you that need to make custom seals for boxes. It's actually a quick and easy way to make seals. Highly recommend it if you're, if you're doing dev, where, uh, dev work where you need seals. Um, so uh, going to the power supply, we wanted something that is interchangeable, right? So that 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 had a charging unit that made it easy to work with. So we came upon uh, using power tool batteries because a they're plentiful. Um, uh, in fact, I believe Milwaukee is the largest importer of lithium-ion batteries uh, in the United States because, uh, well, at least the parent company, they also make Ryobi. So. Power tools, uh, lots of uh, lots of them out there, and then also they're ruggedized. They, they're created 
for use. And so we adapted to that and we created our control unit to use one of those as the power supply. Um, what's important for us is that we didn't want to have to develop an entire battery system. And you need something interchangeable because in the middle of, a, uh, of use, you might need more power. Uh, so, you know, integrated battery is a bad idea if you need to take off your unit and charge it in the sod. Uh, here's a, a very quick uh, uh, schematic of uh, the different components. Both of the, the housing is 3D printed also. It is um, uh, using Petchy. The board, uh, we custom fabbed a board. Um, uh, Patrick uh, designed it, and we'll take a look at that in a second. You can see the battery. Um, and so, uh, yeah, this is the uh, this is the PCB, and as you can see, we have uh, many different features in this. Uh, going off the top, we s we do th we have connectors for the battery. There is the potentiometer that switches it on and also controls the speed. So, um, the speed of the fan, uh, we can adjust it from very very slow to very very quick. We don't have um, steps on it right now. It's just a it's just a, a, a swiping flow, so you can adjust it um, more or less analog, uh, in an analog way. Um, the battery has a ga uh, gauge, uh, the, the LEDs. There's four LEDs that signify the, the battery level. Uh, it's important to give a visual, and uh, we also have a buzzer in there that uh, gives an audio uh, uh, sound for when the battery gets low. Uh, one of the things that all PAPRs require is a visual indication, and um, uh, and if the visual uh, indicator is not within the field of view, I believe it needs also definitely an audio indicator that uh, that you know you don't have enough power. Um, so yeah, we have um, the we have a um, PWM. Uh, now, uh, interesting enough, we added in a power jack. Um, so there's a 12 volt power jack on the inside of the connector. Uh, the reason why that's actually kind of really nice is because if you're in a car, you can plug that into your car and it'll run um, off of that. So we thought about our Uber drivers and uh, uh, delivery people, um, you know, in terms of usage. Um, and uh, as you can see, um, most of the other uh, little portions. And overall, you know, in quantities of 100, they become fairly affordable. So the entire cost thirteen dollars for in, in quantities of a hundred. And uh, here's a good look at the board. If you have any questions at all, please come up to Patrick and uh, talk to Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> yes, th there's this bus that I'm throwing you under. Um, oh, and we also included an e-fuse in there uh, just in case you trigger by, let's say plugging in that 12 volt into um, uh, the wrong plug or backwards or something. Okay, uh, the last component to this is the, the mask. And uh, what we've done so far is we've created these adapters for uh, the 3M um, half-face respirators. Going back to that entire annoying uh, bayonet socket that they have, we've actually created 3D printable models that allow you to attach this uh, to a hose setup. And forgive me for using a picture of Myself, this is like so. You can get your own bane mask uh, set up um, uh, that essentially will give you filtered air, but it all uh, stays nicely contained. Uh, and uh, you and the actual 3M face masks are, uh, if you get the um, silicone ones, actually are very comfortable um, and they fit uh, quite well. Uh, we we have the physical models, which we can, um, you know, if you want to come up and look at it closer. Uh, quick acknowledgement of the team. Um, these are members of our team. Uh, we wouldn't be here without everybody on this team because, as you can probably tell, this takes a large team, not just a single, you know, no single person is going to be able to hack all the way through this. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a cross-country, uh, cross-national team. Uh, Jamie right there is actually uh, over in um, uh, I believe sunny right now, uh, uh, UK. It's, it's actually quite <laughs> sunny. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, and Burhan and Kevin are both on the East Coast. Uh, Mark, Daniel, me, uh, Patrick, and Sean, we're all here. So if you want to talk to us, uh, uh, we'll be happy to talk. So what's our next steps? Uh, solutions for other than COVID. Well, PAPRs are really useful, especially in California, where we catch on fire every other week and air quality suddenly goes from eh to ugh. 
and uh, you know, PAPRs are useful. Uh, we're trying to solve the uh, proprietary mask issue because getting a good mask on the face, 3D printing right now probably can't handle this. Um, so we're looking into uh, ways of solving that. Uh, we are trying to um, uh, publish our current iterations uh, so that uh, more people can it. And uh, you know, we might go for a Kickstarter. Anybody have an extra $2 million that um, they would like to uh, donate? Uh, uh, Mark is right here. He'll take the check. But uh, for a call to action, um, uh, what we're looking for is we need help. Um, uh, we want help getting the word out. Uh, we want help if you have any design chops uh, for getting a mask solution, or if you know anybody that wants to work on mask designs, um, and help building. So we want to make sure that this is something that uh, is doable from people just looking at our website and just you know uh, printing it themselves at home. So if you have a 3D printer or you know people that want to take on a project like this, a maker space in your local area that wants a project, uh, direct them to our website and uh, you know we'll be happy to interface with them if they need help. But hopefully everything's already documented and they can just you know go to the website and just make it themselves. And then finally, uh, documentation and instructions. Um, uh, most of us are engineers and. Um, I, I believe uh, literally challenged, or uh, 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 or verbally challenged, actually. Yeah, I literarily challenged, but um, actually, um, you know, just documentation and also uh, converting instructions to uh, to a wider audience is actually pr um, pretty important. Yeah, different languages also. Yeah, uh, as as uh, Mark was saying before, we've actually have uh, members that were in other uh, countries. Um, uh, North Africa uh, was uh, one one of the places. And uh, you know the, the the different language aspects are uh, definitely a challenge, and uh, we'll we'll need we'll we'll need to if we want to get to these other markets and help um, uh, some of the, the places that could really benefit from this type of open medical hardware. We will definitely need um, language help. And uh, yeah, that's my presentation. Thank you. I think uh, we have a question here. I was going to say, why don't you repeat your question? Oh. You only have one mic. Sure. So you talked a little bit, uh, you, you sort of alluded to it earlier, but I, I, you talked a little bit about the regulatory filings that you had to make? Ah, okay. So uh, uh, the question is about regulatory filings, uh, if we've made any regulatory filings. Uh, uh, right now, we haven't. Uh, we're not. Uh, we're not currently going through the NIOSH process. So PAPRs are actually governed by NIOSH. Um, um, uh, government agency that uh, certifies uh, these uh, uh, these PPE devices. Um, uh, we are we are currently working on making sure that our devices are uh, a can be made right, and then b pass the the bare minimum testing that we're 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 putting through it right now. We're hoping to get it to the level where it could pass NIOSH. But one of the issues with NIOSH certification is that it is not designed for do it yourself, build it at home. NIOSH certification requires you to certify the entire chain of creation and um, uh, manufacturing. So an open source device will probably never pass the current set of NIOSH rules because they have to go and, you know, for example, you need an ISO 9000 certified factory um, that is governed by NIOSH and, and, and that's not going to happen with an open source device that you're, you're making for at home. That's why we're asking for $2 million. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, so uh, FDA doesn't um, doesn't actually regulate the, the that space. This is the, the NIOSH regulates um, uh, the space. So NIOSH could come out. So so the reason why you want NIOSH approval is because if you want to sell it commercially, and um, you, know, you want it to be uh, used in 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 regulated spaces, um, because NIOSH is closely associated with uh, OSHA. You know, um, if you're if you're in a field that requires uh, the usage of a PAPR. Uh, it has to be certified by NIOSH, otherwise you're not covered uh, under, uh, you know, your protection of your employees, and therefore there's liability issues there. So if you're going to be using it on a uh, on a commercial venture or uh, you know employment as a as a protective measure, then it's probably not um, uh, it's not going to happen with an open source in the current regulatory environment. Um, keep in mind, you know, like 
the pandemic's really shifted a lot of thought processes on this because one of the one of the things, as I pointed out in the beginning, they told us to use bandanas, right? They told us to use bandanas. There, uh, at the beginning, there was a lot of emergency use um, authorization for a lot of things. Um, if we get into another situation where we're in a pandemic situation, um, we might hit another time when they're basically saying, use what you got. What we're trying to do is give you, in this project, to give you a reasonable alternative that's better than a bandana, right? Yeah, yeah actually, so, so you had a question next, and then there was a, so did it, do we answer your question? Oh, okay. Right. Right. Uh, uh, excellent question. So the question is, is that uh, we are testing it with equipment that um, most people don't have. Um, how do we guarantee that if you do it at home, that you're meeting to the same um, um, same standards? And that's actually open uh, to uh, debate right now. We will be uh, in our uh, build guides uh, give you best practices, right, of what we found that works. Um, uh, Unfortunately, like any kind of uh, implementation at, at home for anything that you do, it's subject to the skill of the person that's doing it, right? And uh, there's no real way to guarantee that. And that's actually one of the problems with trying to go with NIOSH is that NIOSH can't say, well, this person knows how to run a 3D printer. Uh, that is a problem. Not yet, but uh, that's something we can look into. Right now, we're trying to get uh, devices that um, uh, seal. Th that we what we do is we we try to build in in the design enough uh, overlap that you you know there shouldn't be a failure um, uh, with the tolerances of the average 3D printer. But for example, if you start printing and you have gaps in your 3D printing where you're you know there there's air leaks because your 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 printing isn't good, there's nothing we can do to control that right now. And that, I mean, that, that's a, a valid question of what do we do about that? And um, it, it's actually a problem in uh, FDA certification for devices uh, is uh, what do they, you know, how do you regulate that space? Right. Uh, so what Daniel was saying, uh, for just to record, um, is that uh, we need to figure out ways to to do uh, rudimentary testing uh, for quality control in a decentralized way, and that's the, uh, it's an it's an open problem still, right? So uh, that's something that uh, we definitely need brain power on. Uh, uh, in the first presentation of the the series in the morning, we talked about um, uh, testing and uh, the need for independent third-party testing. Um, 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 and one of the issues with uh, PPE is that a lot of that testing equipment is fairly high-end and they're not, you know, it's, it's not generally used in other fields besides the particle testing, right? You're looking at particle filtration. Um, so, you know, there, there might be only select centers that can do that just because the equipment um, is, doesn't exist as a, you know, it's not as common as an oscilloscope so you're going to have uh, uh, issues with that. Um, again, uh, open. Uh, these are still open uh, uh, issues. But I'd like to go back to the the, the original thought process behind this entire uh, uh, this entire project, right? Which is uh, my mantra in the beginning was do better than a ban bandana, and it is a sad statement that you know in 2020 uh, that that was my mantra, but that was my mantra, and I and this is. Uh, uh, the progression of that uh, work, basically. Yes. Uh, yes. Let me go back to.
That one does M95. This one does N100. This one does T100. And the difference between T100 and N100 is, are you trying to filter oil out of the air? Right? And if you're trying to filter oil out of the air, uh, we actually have to have a more, a, a more powerful fan. So that's one of the big trade-offs, is that the more powerful the fan, the less battery life you have. So the battery life on this is two to three hours per charge, which is why you have to have the hot swap fit, you know, hot swap. Um, whereas with the N100, the, the bigger fan actually, uh, it's, it's the amperage draw is about a fifth, so you can actually have it run for a good eight hours, a good full shift, and you'll be fine. Um, using the same logic, the same everything here, right? You do need to have a filter, uh, thermal filter, right? For the, uh, for the different fans. Uh, but, yeah, so this is N100, which would be if you just, like, if you're in a forest fire situation, thank you, if you're in a forest, if you're trying to, like, you know, deal with the periodic forest fire, air pollution, or whatever, you can just use this. But if for whatever reason you're near a chemical spill or, like, an oil spill or something like that, uh, then you could use something like this. And uh, so... So on this, this is using the first germ guardian filter, and you can also see like the, we have the a different attachment process. That's another thing that we've iterated on is attachment belts of things. Um, and so this one is N95, not N100, because it's using that HEPA HEPA filter in the uh, in the box. The other, sorry, uh, just real quick, I was going to say the other thing that we've been looking at is other masks other than 3M. Uh, this is a this is a mask from a, uh, an Australian company called Active Mask, um, and we've been working with them. Um, we had an interesting meeting with them earlier this week where we were like, "Your mask is not quite up to snuff," and they're like, "Yeah, we know, we know it's not." It's like because they were like, "You should distribute this mask in the U.S.," and we're like, "Well, it wouldn't pass NIOSH standards at all," and they're like, "Yes, we we now we figured that out." So they're they're gonna they're going back to the drawing board, but. Because what we, we want to do to, like, we need to get something that isn't a 3M mask, right? So we want to, and these guys are very positive. Are they open source? Not even kind of, right? But at least they're willing and amenable to working with us to produce something that we can, that we can attach to. We have a distinct sense that if we were to talk to 3M, they'd be like, what the, what are you doing? What's going on? Like, no, don't do that. So maybe they would be fine, but we, we just haven't told them. Yeah. Uh, but go, going back to the, like the level filtration, so if you see, uh, if you saw our uh, diagram, we're basically coupling a fan to a filter, right? And so it's just the quality of the filter. So one of the nice things about our model is that you can make a custom uh, uh, filter uh, input on top of the model. Yeah, and you can add whatever filter you can find. So the the thing is, is that it's a matter of finding the right filters and the materials for your your particular application. One of the issues that we came up with was the fact that uh, we uh, I think I mentioned um, that we were trying to go for non-rationed um, uh, materials for COVID, and that's why we went with the HEPA filter uh, as opposed to using uh, you know like an actual cartridge filter or something from 3M. Is because those were unavailable. Yeah, you can get them, right. And there are PAPR units out there. Uh, there's actually a company that, uh, uh, there, there's a PAPR unit uh, produced in Canada that will take um, the, 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 the 3M cartridges and um, uh, tie to it. Is it open source? Yeah, well, the, the guy that was, you know, you can order one from him, and it's, I think it's open source still? Yeah. Uh, you sh it but it's not. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's, it, 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 it's, not, uh, it's not regulated or it's not been approved for anything. But again, it's the filtering material. We're not we're not making filtering material, and it, the level of filtration just comes from you know what filter material you're going to use. Yeah. Uh, we have not done that. What we're trying to do is make a uh, we're, tr we're we're trying to balance to see if we get enough. Uh, we're tr right now, uh, frankly, we're trying to find the right fan so that we can balance the uh, amount of power. Uh, with just getting enough flow uh, throughout, so we're not measuring the the, the drop uh, uh, across the the filter uh, w when it gets to a clog state yet. Yeah, uh, we'll, 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 we're looking at sort of active sensing also, but that include that that it, that basically ramps up the the cost of um, uh, of everything if we put in a pressure sensor uh, for the, for the flow. Um, 
uh, for the right pressure sensor? Yeah, and uh, th you know the other thing is that we made this so that it'd be printed on a th um, uh, on FDM printers or FFF printers, right? So the the design choices that we made for it to be printable uh, is different than what you would want if you were doing an injection molded or some uh, other uh, more commercial um, uh, housing. And so um, th th that's the interesting thing. It's like uh, you also have to take into account the nuances of the the printing technology. In the development of the plastic pieces, like orientation of print and um, uh, you know uh, the, the thickness of uh, walls in terms of uh, what you can get out of your nozzle and stuff like that, and we've 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 done a lot of iteration on that to try to get uh, uh, to get a consistent uh, print that works. Yeah, but right. No, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. The uh, it, it, it's a good idea because that will that will test for leakage. The 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 question is, is I mean, there there's going to be some in, inherent leak. The question is, is the fan going to uh, over? Is the fan ever going to? Uh, is the filter ever going to be occluded enough that it would actually uh, 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 activate the 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 actual leak uh, portion of that? Yeah. Well, we we could do that test. Right. Right. That, that's a great idea. Yeah. No, that, that's great. Yeah, no, no, that's excellent. I, I, I like that. I will we'll, we'll put that on the list. <laughs> Design ideas. I, I, we'll, 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 we'll take both. <laughs> uh, the question is: Is the battery low? Uh, uh, is that a, at a percentage? Uh, yeah. So I, I measured the uh, the battery, dr you know, discharge curve, and then we decided that at this voltage, it's at 90% depleted, and the buzzer goes off. Piso electric, piso. Yeah, it's a little piso electric buzzer. So, so you're not doing Coulomb counting. You're actually using the voltage curve, which is really, really tough on lithium batteries because it's a darn flat, right? It falls off the edge like poof, right? I'm, yeah, we're just duplicating what uh, Milwaukee is doing on their end, on the battery meter. Design change right there. I think that was the comment. Cool. No, I mean, um, 
like this is great. Uh, the discussion is what we're looking for. Uh, we've mostly been constrained by eyes on the project, right? You know, like uh, you know, we would love to have more people involved, especially if you if you can help contribute on any of the development side. Uh, most of us, we've been doing this, um, um, you know, on the side when we have free time uh, to do it, uh, or in my case, um, when I'm uh, sleeping and printing in my dreams and also in real life. Um, yeah, my friends play video games. I play Fusion 360. It's really getting to the <laughs> yeah, it's getting to the point where it's a uh, getting uh, kind of obsessive. I, so uh, looking for help. Um, but please uh, contact us at um, uh, tetrabee.io uh, tetra uh, uh, um, or check us out on GitHub also. Um, and um, you know, thank you.